Morning and welcome to our third Sunday in Advent. And today we're going to be talking about joy. Now we've had some great preachers so far from Kerry um, on love and from Gavin Calver on peace. And those were fantastic. But today we're going to be looking at joy. Joy. What does that actually mean? I've heard it sung. J-O-Y, J-O-Y, surely that must mean Jesus first, yourself last and others in between. There we are. Sorted. Preach done. We've had a Christmas jingle and we've had a definition of joy. So that's it. Done? No, of course not. <laughs> joy. What does joy mean? Well, the dictionary definition of joy um, often seems to reflect around happiness, which is what we might immediately assume. Joy is happiness. And the dictionary definition will probably say great happiness or great delight. But we understand that actually there's something deeper about joy when we think of it in a spiritual context. There's something much, much deeper about joy when we look at it spiritually. And so often we find ourselves quoting a little verse of scripture that comes from the Old Testament that says, the joy of the Lord is your strength, from which we get this sense that actually joy is something that can empower us and can give us the ability to move forward when things are tough. And we take great courage from that, great, great strength from that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And it suggests that there is far more to joy than perhaps just great happiness. But the verse that that um, comes from in the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, the little bit before that I thought was really interesting. It says, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There it is. But don't you just love that bit that comes before? Because I thought, wow, that's a great verse for Christmas, isn't it? Especially after the year we've had where many of us have experienced a sense of grief. But here we are. Let's take this to heart. Let's go and enjoy some choice food and sweet drinks. Let's remember those who don't have anything prepared. And let's enjoy this time of year. Joy, the joy of the Lord is your strength. But it's all very well me saying that. Where can we find joy? Where is it that we find joy? Well, I know from my own experience that it has been in coming into that close relationship with my Father God through the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that I have come to experience and really understand this deep and intimate joy. And it's beyond anything I could have imagined, beyond anything I could have expected in my life before I knew Jesus. And it's God himself who invites us into this close, intimate relationship. He really longs for that with us, with every single one of us. He wants that close friendship. In fact, if we look at a verse in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, God says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. He is, it's an invitation here to come into a relationship with him, to come into dialogue with him, to ask him questions. Where is it that I can find joy? Where is it that I can come to know and understand these great mysteries? It's in God himself. And it is in, through, it's through the work of Jesus, what he did in dying on the cross, that we can come to have that relationship with God. But also, more than that, there is a third person in the relationship, not just God, not just Jesus. There's also the Holy Spirit. And it is, I believe, in the work of the Holy Spirit that we discover this real deep-seated joy, this spiritual joy that I was talking about. And it is in relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to allow him to be in us, to work with us, to work in us. And in doing so, I believe we will find joy. Now, why do I think that? Well, there's a verse in Galatians that talks about something called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is something that is produced through the work of the Holy Spirit. And that can be 
in us. Let's just have a look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The ingredients is water, glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, amino acids, fatty acids. Do you know what? I once saw this and it said, if you were to see this, would you give this to your children to eat? For most of us, we'd look at it and think, wow, that's an awful lot of chemicals I really don't understand. Doesn't really look very good, does it? All the ingredients, mm, not too sure. Well, let me tell you, that is the ingredients of a banana. All of those are what make up a banana. That's the ingredients. And what fascinates me about the fruit of the Holy Spirit is we so often think about it just as being the different bits of ingredients. But actually, I believe the fruit of the Holy Spirit is something that is complete. And in a sense, the bits that we look at almost thinking that it's individual fruits is actually the ingredients. Let's just have a look at that verse properly now. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. We've been looking at those. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Isn't that amazing? But here we have it, love, joy, peace. So when we get the Holy Spirit in us, then we can express and start to express this fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is what can come out of us. This is where we find joy. It is in the Holy Spirit that we find joy. But then how do we express that joy? I wonder, how do we express it? Well, to be perfectly honest, I would say that our expression is as individual as our personalities. We express it however we are uniquely made and according to our unique personalities. And that's for us to explore how we express joy. So I don't really want to ask that question, how do we express joy? More so, I would like to ask the question, not how, but what happens when? What happens when we express joy? Thinking about personalities and character and, and things like that did make me think about Jesus himself. And there's a verse in John, John 1, verses 4 to 5 is what I've got here, but these are verses that we often come across, particularly at this time of year. And in verse 4, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. In him was life. Now, that was the expression of who he was, wasn't it? That life that came out of him and is the light to all mankind. That was Jesus' expression. And I would encourage us to express joy as much as we can because we know it is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. A part of that life is joy. But what happens when we express that joy? Well, if we're talking about light, this next verse, verse five, really does illuminate that, no pun intended. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This verse has become something that's been a real encouragement to me personally, just in recent weeks. And it started um, on the occasion when our Jemima was poorly. She wasn't well, and it was a very difficult time. It wasn't easy at all. And there were moments where I just thought, what's the point? I don't know if you ever have moments where things can get tough and you just think, oh, what's the point? Point. And I did have a few moments like that where I felt that sense in a way of darkness pushing in and pressing in on us. And then a friend contacted me and she gave me some spiritual context, you know, put, sorry, put the situation into a bit of a spiritual context for me. And it led me to this verse, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And I was so encouraged by that image that actually Darkness cannot be overcome by light. And it reminds me of a story that I heard in primary school, and I feel like probably everybody heard this story in primary school. I heard it several times in primary school, but then I realized that actually not everybody's experiences are the same. So you might not have heard this story. So I'm going to tell it to you just in case you haven't. And it is a folk tale. 
But it is something that just reminds us of the power of light. Well, there was a gentleman who had three sons and he decided rather than the usual tradition of giving his inheritance to the oldest son, he decided that he would give the inheritance to the one who was perhaps the most intelligent, the cleverest, the wisest. So he decided to test them and he gave them each a penny and he told them to go to market and purchase something with that penny, obviously in the olden days when pennies were still worth something, to purchase something from the market that would fill his barn. Off goes son number one, comes back from the market the next day, and his purchase that he has bought with his penny is as many feathers as a penny would buy him. He tosses them all into the barn in the hope that they are going to fill the barn. But of course they don't. They're not enough feathers to fill the barn that he was able to purchase for a penny. The second son, he sees the first son make the mistake, thinks, oh, I can do better than that. He goes off to market the next week, comes back with a bale of straw for a penny. I wish I could still buy a bale of straw for a penny. That would be good. And I can tell you, I deal with straw every morning. Straw does not go far. For, I'm forever trying to make straw go further than it actually does go because I'm trying to be as economical as possible in sorting out a horse's bed. But straw does not go very far. And on this occasion, the straw did not fill the barn. The youngest son had watched the two older sons and he was, hmm, he had an idea. He went off to market the following week and he came back with a candle. He then took the candle into the barn, lit the candle and the light filled the barn. And of course, there we are. He was the one who received the inheritance. <laughs> now that's just a simple little story, but light is so powerful. It can fill dark places. Let's just remember that verse again. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The actual word in there, overcome, can be translated in two different ways. It can be translated as overcome, but it also can be translated as understood. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. The darkness does not actually, it can't comprehend the light. It doesn't understand how the light works. And I find that so encouraging at this time where perhaps there'll be moments where we might feel that the darkness is pushing in or that things might be worrying us or that there's pressure on us. But remembering that the light, the life of Jesus overcomes that and is so much more powerful, so much so the darkness does not even understand it. It is a really, really powerful image that we can see just how, what a difference light makes. And I really wanted to encourage you with that today because in the context of joy, if we can really grasp hold of the fruit of the Spirit, of being walking closely with the Spirit so that joy comes out of us, I believe that it's like the life of Jesus, that light then illuminates out of us and can impact the world around us. And I really want to encourage you that in the same way let, as Jesus' light shines, let your light shine before others. Allow joy to become that expression through you this Christmas time because I believe it will make a difference in other people's lives. It will be like the light overcoming darkness. So let me, sorry, read that verse again. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And we don't do this for our own glory. We don't seek to express joy for our own glory, but to glorify our Father in heaven. Let's be so full of joy this Christmas that we make a great difference in the lives of those around us. Thanks for being with us today. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard and I hope you enjoy the rest of this service.